Just quickly introduce myself. I'm Richard. I'm a town planner and a designer. We've done a lot of work with villages. Please don't be put off by the urban bit. Uh, we've done a lot of rural planning in communities around this part of the world. We're based in Bournemouth. We're not local, but we've worked in places near Paddock Wood and in Kent and East Sussex and Lewis as well. So we've got quite a lot of experience as an independent a uh, company that advises parish councils on this type of work. So I just want to make it clear we do not work for Rother District Council and we are not part of the parish council, we're independent of that, helping them prepare the plan. So that's who we are. Um, this presentation, which I'm going to go through, I'm going to explain neighbourhood planning, what it is, how it works and so on. The background to the Ticehurst plan and the things that have been done to get to where it is. Um, and then this middle bit here, the, the neighbourhood plan itself, I'm just going to take you through it, almost page by page, very quickly to say this is what's in the plan. These are the bits you need to perhaps focus on. And then at the end, then, how to comment and quest, uh, provide your, your feedback. Um, and then we've got time for questions and answers at the end. So that's what I'm going to do. So one thing that uh, we've used as a little sort of statement in many projects we've worked on, and Ticehurst in a sense is no different than the parish, all places are sort of growing or declining. Uh, nothing stays the same. And many places we work, particularly like rural parishes like Ticehurst, where you've got Stonegate Village and Flynnwell as well, and a lot of people say it's perfect the way it is. We don't want it to change. But you, I'm afraid that's not possible. Things are going to change in the future. Things could get better, things could get bigger, things could get smaller. We've worked in many places where they said we've lost our village shop, the school is under threat of closure. We actually need more housing to keep this place alive. So they're looking for growth to stop that decline. Other places say we've grown quickly in, in recent years, we don't need any more. But the, the message is that nothing stays the same. So what the, a plan and town planning and neighbourhood planning is about is trying to anticipate that change and manage it on your terms. And that's what the, the Ticehurst plan is trying to do. So it's about projecting into the future and looking ahead and trying to understand the changes that are happening. So neighbourhood plans, what are they? Well, in 2011, uh, the government, coalition government back then introduced the Localism Act, and that um, introduced the power for a parish or town council to create a legally binding plan. Up until that point, uh, only a borough or district council could create a town planning document. Parishes couldn't do it. And the following year, the National Planning Policy Framework enshrined that with the Neighbourhood Planning Act as well, that a parish or town council could create a, na uh, a legally binding statutory planning document in the Neighbourhood Planning Regulations with the part that, that supported that. Underlining all of this is the plan for growth. And I put that in inverted commas, that's a phrase that was used that neighbourhood planning and local plans should look to develop land for housing, economic development, and activities of that sort. They should not try and frustrate that. You can manage it, you can put it in places where you think works best, and you can perhaps limit the amount, but you shouldn't be trying to create a plan that has zero in it. So that was a positive, it's called planning positively, and that's part of the, the act there. So we, the Ticehurst plan, we feel, is doing that uh, effectively. This uh, paragraph from the National Planning Policy Framework, paragraph 183, it's important, neighbourhood planning gives communities direct power to develop a shared vision for their neighbourhood and deliver the sustainable development they need. The last part there is about de delivering development, and that's planning positively, the, the plan for growth. The shared vision that I've underlined, we've tried through the process to get as many ideas as we can and create a plan that represents the consensus as, as far as we can get it. There will be people that aren't happy with all of the plan, there'll be people happy with some of the plan, but as far as possible we're trying to get that shared vision in place. The reason that is important is at the end of this process there's going to be a referendum, a local referendum on the plan. When the, f the final plan is put out there for adoption by Rother District Council as a statutory planning document, the people that live in the electoral area of, of Ticehurst Parish on the electoral roll will get a vote, yes, no, do you wish the plan to become the adopted plan for the area. So if people open that final version and don't recognise ideas that relate to them or are relevant to them, and they can't see that vision that they can support, they'll either vote no or just not vote at all. So the shared vision aspect is important. We've tried if, uh, as far as we can to get that in the plan. So what can they actually do? Well, a neighbourhood plan can set policies to determine planning applications. That's primarily what they do. When a planning application comes in in future, once your plan is in place for any piece of land in the district, rather district's council's first document they will pick up to assess that for a yes or no granting of planning permission will be the neighbourhood plan. What does the neighbourhood plan say about this piece of land and this type of proposal? So it will become the document that is used to grant planning permission or not. They can describe the quality of development in an area, design guidance, the type of buildings to expect, the scale, the materials, and so on. That's in the plan that we've got out uh, today, the draft version. 
There is a mechanism that allows them to grant planning permission directly. It's not in the Thai Sirst one at this stage, but a local uh, neighborhood development order can actually describe planning permission, and planning permission can come directly through the neighborhood plan in certain instances. <coughs> and that last point, planning positively, uh, the power to promote more development than the local plan. And uh, that's important too. In certain parts of the country, particularly in sort of the north of England, rural areas, where they've not had a lot of housing development, but they've wanted more, they're going over and above what the local plan is asking and saying we need, do need more housing in this area. Neighbourhood plans give you that power. There's a, a sort of system within which they fit. So neighbourhood plans need to be, and this is the phrase, general conformity with adopted national and local planning policy. So the national planning policy framework sets out for the whole country what planning should do in the United Kingdom. Well, actually, it's England and Wales. And that system sets out policies. Your neighbourhood plan needs to fit with that. You can't contradict it fundamentally. It needs to generally conform. Rother District Council has adopted strategic policies for the whole area, for the whole borough, the district. It needs to conform with that. And within that, the neighbourhood plan can deal with matters that are important in the neighbourhood area. So there is a sort of a hierarchy, national policy, local policy, and then the neighbourhood plan can express itself within that. As long as it is in general conformity and does not fundamentally contradict either of those two layers above it, it's good uh, as a plan to be adopted. And there's a test to make sure that it does that. So this is your neighbourhood plan area, this diagram, it appears in the, in, the, in the document. The dotted line around the outside is your boundary. Interestingly, you've taken not all of Buell water, but most of it. A little bit, I think, belongs to Wadhurst Parish. I'd love to see sort of a, a little floating thing down the middle, like having a swimming pool uh, for the boundary of your plan uh, in the corner. Uh, in yellow, we've picked out in the sort of golden yellow colour, Flinwell, Tysa, Stonegate, the th three primary settlements, but we know there's three leg cross and other bits around it. And this network of lanes, um, historic movement pattern with the ridges uh, of the landscape, this productive landscape in this part of the world, and still get on a high piece of land to the south there. And that historic um, landscape has been an important part of the plan as well. So that's the area within which the policies apply. Neighbourhood plans can't write policies for bits of land outside their boundary. So uh, even if people wanted to talk about traffic issues over the east or the west, the policies apply within so where are we in this process? What uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we're at a very important part of the process. Well, point one there, defining the neighbourhood area. What is the extent of the plan? That boundary was approved. The boundary is the same as the parish boundary, which is sensible to do that. Preparing the plan, we've prepared it. And we're now at this bit highlighted in yellow, the formal six-week consultation, which is Regulation 14, as it's known in the, in the technical bit. This might look alarming that we've not got very far. We've got a long way to go. But it's not, that's not how it reads. We've actually, the preparing the plan is the biggest bit of time, and there's been a year or so or, or more doing that. What follows should happen quite rapidly, we would hope. Consider revisions and changes. After the end of this consultation period, which ends 14th of uh, February, we need to gather, gather all the comments back from all the public that are filled in the questionnaire, find out what their views are on the draft, which bits they like, which bits they don't, which bits should be improved. We also need to listen to comments from the statutory agencies, Natural England, Environment Agency, Historic England. They will all comment on the draft as well. What do they think of the plan? The steering group will consider the revisions and changes. They will make those changes as they see, see fit. They won't have to enable all of them, but they need to have a reason for what they've done and why. The plan will go to Rother District Council. They will then publish it for another six weeks, which is Regulation 16. So there'll be a second chance to see the, the final version of the plan. During that time, an examiner will be appointed, and that examiner will be a, a professional planning uh, a person, probably with a long career in local government, and that examiner, he or she, will look at the submission plan that has been submitted at that point, and check it for that general conformity that I mentioned. Does it fit with national policy? Does it fit with local policy? The examiner will not be that concerned with decisions you've made about what's important and what isn't. That's a choice for you to make. The examiner's role is primarily and very um, tightly described as, has it been done uh, in line with the regulations, not do you agree or disagree with the choices inside it. If the examiner feels that it has met the regulations, they will recommend it goes forward to that referendum. And if the referendum votes yes, the majority uh, of those that, that turn out to vote vote yes, it becomes the adopted plan for the area. So although that diagram looks like there's a lot to, to get through, these steps that follow this formal consultation should happen quite quickly. The reason this is an important point in the process is that during preparing the plan there's been lots of informal consultation, there's been surveys, questionnaires, we've had meetings in this room, we've had drawings on the table, we've been out and doing site visits, taking photos, there's been lots of informal uh, information gathering which has been really really valuable 
But the bit that really matters in order to make the changes that follow is the consultation period that we're in now. And that's why the questionnaires, if we can get as many people as possible to fill as many of the questions in as, as they can, give as many answers as they can, they're the ones that really count. So what happened to get us here? Well, 2015, the steering group uh, here in Tysus was established and they did some early work preparing it, getting that boundary established. Uh, 2016, significant series of events uh, here in this room and uh, in other parts of the parish as well, up in Flimwell and down in Stonegate as well. We had some early draft policies emerging from that. Late in 2016, there were some more events looking at different um, developments. During that time, there was what's called the call for sites where they looked for housing land that could be included in the plan and went through a process of ruling things in, ruling things out. Early 2017, concerted action on the, the land search to try and make sure the ones were right. Preparation of the plan, there was something called a strategic environmental assessment, an SEA, that's a, a, a requirement of the plan to make sure the housing land choices are the most sustainable that they can be in line with the regulations. And the draft policies and proposals were put together. Um, and then by late 2017, the plan was ready and was published. And it, the, the publication date was 2nd of January this year when it went out for consultation. So that's what's, that's what's gone through to get us this far. What came out of that was this structure for the plan. Uh, housing, infrastructure, employment, and the rural characteristics of the parish were important. And together they, they were to deliver the major aims of the plan. That's how it's been structured and set out. So, that's the, the background. What I'm going to do now is whiz through the plan itself, pretty much page by page. I'm not going to read all of it out, and I don't expect you to see it on screen, but as we move through, we've got the beginnings of the plan. It's quite a chunky document. It goes over 100 pages, contents of it all. These are the policies. If people want an at-a-glance look, page six of the plan gives you those four key components that were in the diagram there. Rural policies, employment policies, housing, social and community. One of, the things, one of the, the things a steering group member mentioned to me this, this morning is that early work, just how much employment matters in Ticehurst. It's a working parish, there's a high number of people employed that, that don't necessarily live in Ticehurst Parish but work here and the plan's keen to support and en encourage that, that it shouldn't become a dormitory place where people live but don't work, which is why there's a significant number of employment policies in the plan. And I'd say more so than other places of a similar characteristic. I think Ticehurst is a working parish more so than others. So there are the policies, there's some uh, explanation at the beginning, introduction, the background to it all, how that uh, was put together, which we don't really need to read here, some of those images about the, the work that went on, and there's a great little summary of the, the parish as it was in the past, how it is today, and also expect, uh, an understanding that you, it's not just Tysus, every time I say Tysus it's the parish, we've got Flinwell and there's Stonegate as well, and those settlements are a, get recognition on equal status as it were in terms of the way the policies are applied to these villages as well. And this is your context, you've got the uh, high wheeled AOMB, the area of outstanding natural beauty in the darker green colour. You can see that the purple dot there is your, is your parish right in the middle pretty much and you've got Greater London to the north and the south coast. So you're in the southeast of England right in the heart of it, protected landscape, the highest designation of protection, protected landscape in the country outside of a national park, the AOMB. And you are also in the part of the country where the need for housing and affordable housing is at its greatest. So there are two things coming together here, landscape protection, the need for development. And the neighbourhood plan is trying to reconcile those two things. And this diagram geographically puts you in the heart of this. Again, that's the diagram we've just seen, the neighbourhood area. And this shared vision is explained here. The vision statement is on page 24. And, and it's not just a single vision. Tysus has one, Flinwell has one, Stonegate has one. We want people's comments on those. And that uh, diagram that explains the aims of the plan and the objectives. So, ten objectives for the plan. These things are the, the policies try and implement. Again, we want comments on that. And the rural policies, again, what we've got here our area of outstanding natural beauty, how the plan supports that. A little diagram of that ridge, the topography, the pinky colours, higher land. It's a you know, really important uh, settlement pattern with Tysus and Stonegate high up and, and the land in between dropping down. You can see Buell Water on that image there. Um, green gaps between settlements, that was something that people were very keen to see, not a coalescence between Flinwell and Tysus, there's a, a sense that it's creeping down the hill and they're merging together, trying to keep them separate and that, that policy sets that out. Protecting green spaces and how these will be allocated. These spaces here uh, on this plan have a designation in the neighbourhood plan to protect them from development. It's a power that a neighbourhood plan has and they've applied them to these spaces here. We've done a similar thing in Stonegate and in Flinwell. We've already had a landowner, 
who are, has number five up there, you know, not happy with that. They would like to have that designation removed. It's on the allotments, but people may feel that it's important to have it uh, designated. So already there isn't necessarily the agreement on all of this, so that we have this debate, and that's why we're in a consultation phase where people can give their opinion on this. These, as I say, these areas shown in green would be protected from development through the neighbourhood plan. And as a, a table that explains the reasons behind that and so on. Developing footpath and cycle networks across the parish is important as a rural one. And the blue headings in the plan are actions, not policies, but actions. So there's a series of projects and actions that the steering group and others can take forward to make these things happen. And it's important that these get endorsement through referendum as well. Employment policies. We were given a fantastic series of photographs of your business owners, which has really brought the plan to life. Um, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of employment, a lot of retail, a lot of things and high level of activity in Tysa, perhaps more so than other places of a similar size. And this chapter tries to capture some of that, the, the, the faces behind it. Um, so again, background to rural employment land. Here's your smiley taxi driver and uh, we've got hairdressers and all sorts going on. I think it's a great image, this one. Um, and we've got policies about protecting and enhancing those services. Policies that, uh, if we move on, um, look at protecting the heart of the areas. We've got Flinwell's retail area, Ticehurst as well. Supporting tourism and recreation. People felt that was not being exploited in a positive way as, as much as it could be. Uh, Buell Water, for example, people coming for walking and the long distance footpaths and so on. You know, there's more that could be done to encourage tourism in the area and supporting that. Diversification of agricultural businesses linked to that. It might be some farm, farm occupation wants to try and encourage tourism and, and diversify their business. That would support them in doing that. Enhancing and protecting existing employment sites and protecting and enhancing the centre of the villages as well. So again, we've got actions uh, about infrastructure as well and employment actions as well. So that's that, that chunk of the plan. We then move on to policies around, if we click on, housing. And the housing bit has been difficult and perhaps contentious for many about how we can do it. And remember, the regulations ask people to plan positively in their neighbourhood plans. So our aim is to provide high quality housing for all residents in small developments that reflect the high world historic pattern. This is not a big blob of housing in one place. We're trying to find sites that are, are reflective of the way the settlements have grown up over time. So a spatial plan, policy H1, and it sets out uh, these small uh, areas. You can see here on the diagram, this area here is an additional housing area. We've got another one at the top here and a final one over there. They did little, little bits of growth around Tysus to encourage that. And uh, the development boundary of Flimwell is unchanged, uh, apart from one tiny bit, and there's no change at the Stonegate development boundary. So questions have been asked about why Stonegate has not had housing, why Flimwell's only got a bit, and why Tysus has most of it. Well, these are the three areas of um, housing that are allocated in Tysus. The Sustainable Environmental Assessment looked at a whole range of options for housing, and the guidance is saying that if you locate new housing close to existing services and facilities like the shop, the pubs, uh, the cafes, the pharmacy and so on, it's more sustainable and therefore more in line with the guidance and the, the policy. Putting new housing out in Stonegate where there isn't those facilities does not meet the guidance. So the neighbourhood plans working with that and the sites that came forward through the call for sites around Tyshurst were scoring more highly in that process. And that's why they're in the plan at this consultation stage. And this is a table, a summary table that goes with that. Um, it's worth mentioning now that the Sustainable Environmental Assessment is a separate document. It's on the website. You can see all the sites that were assessed, which ones were rejected and which ones were recommended for inclusion. So we want comments on, on both of those documents if you want to provide them. Um, mix of housing sizes. If we move through the plan, there's important data here on the size of number of bedrooms, uh, the type of housing detached, semi-detached flats and so on that people are looking for in future. Affordable housing, policy H4, sets out that 40% of the development size uh, should be affordable of the numbers built. Affordable houses should be allocated to people with a strong connection to Tysers, trying to get local people and local needs uh, met through this policy. And there's again more data on that uh, at the back of the plan. Design of buildings, uh, policy H5, that character that people are very familiar with. Things that we found working elsewhere in the country is uh, initially people seem very anti-development. Uh, they're very anxious about new housing, but the more we talk to them, the more they're, they're more concerned about bad, poor quality development. And small developments of a good quality in the right location, they're, they're quite comfortable with it. 
And we don't have a great track record of delivering high quality schemes in this country and people fear the worst, understandably. So policy H5 is trying to encourage any builder that gets planning permission to build into ISIS does so as a privilege and they should build something that's very, very good and is a legacy that for the future. They can't just throw up a cheap, uh, un unthought through development. Um, and that means we've got some design guidance about conservation and heritage in the plan, the conservation area, housing community actions. And there's a section here on page 80 onwards that sets out the things that are important in terms of architecture, design, layout, roof skates, streets and lanes, settlement patterns, this diagram is really important. It shows that Tysus is not a single area that's built in one, one phase. Uh, the conservation area in the heart of Tysus may have a sort of historic origin, but from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, each decade has layered another little bit on. It's, it's a growing village, it always has for them. And this really uh, reflects the comment I made at the beginning that nothing stays the same. So in the 2000s and beyond, we need to add to this mix, but do so in a way that's very distinctive locally, that people can be proud of it and that it can be of a high quality. And the guidance says that if you can't do that, you won't get permission to build. And it's important that everyone uses the plan when it's adopted to really make the, the architects and the designers who want to build here do their best to add to that legacy and, and not just do the last bit of building they did elsewhere. So building typologies about roof spaces and uh, the way boundary treatments can be uh, introduced. We've got some sketches in here as well about more recent development. Uh, we're not just looking to the past all the time, but some of these details are really special and we've sort of forgotten how to do it. But in this part of the world, these are the things that people recognise and love. So we want more of it, but done in the right way. Uh, so again, that's an important part of the, uh, the, the, uh, the plan, including views to the wider landscape as well, not blocking views in a way that would be detrimental. So uh, resource efficiency, sustainability as well in that section. Community, social infrastructure, the back, back end of the plan, the last section, it talks about the things that people need. Improvements to the village centres. I had a long conversation with a lady this morning about the speed of traffic that rushes through the middle and how that Ticest is really suffering from that. And Flynnwell as well and Stonegate Village Centre, the centres need to be given improvements. And we're looking at how these are sort of conceptual images that people have sort of got fired up about. They're, some people like them, some people don't. But the, the thinking behind the image is that this square should actually be a place where people spend time. It shouldn't be a racetrack for the trucks and lorries from Wadhurst that run down the middle. People should be able to cross the road. Pilot projects are already being talked about with East Sussex to make these things happen. And there's policies in the plan that support these changes here, where the traffic is not dominant. People can cross the road more easily. We can take away some of the white lines and yellow paint that makes drivers go faster and try and create places for people, not places for... Uh, the, the trucks, maybe places for busking if you want it, or maybe not. Um, but these images are trying to get people uh, thinking about it. Here's Flynnwell with perhaps the new community centre on the corner hole farm site and, and crossing the road there as well. Community energy projects get a mention and uh, social spaces, play spaces in housing areas as well. And we've got some actions at the end to wrap that section up. And that's the back of the plan. And there's an appendix. In the appendix there's all the data that's gone into creating these policies. Um, there's a big table there that sets out everything that's all the background evidence that's been put together to make this happen. On the back of the cover, on the back cover, and this I'll zoom in on this, is how to comment. And this is the, the important bit. By email, uh, on the web, there's a dedicated website. By post, there's the, the hard copies of the questionnaire. And there's an online version of the questionnaire that people can click and put their answers in digitally. So we're giving people as many options as possible. Uh, we found in other projects like this that you get as many paper copies as digital. Uh, people like to be a bit old-fashioned and good for them. So do fill one in today or take one away. The deadline for this is Valentine's Day. Okay, so if you don't want to upset your other half and be filling it in on the evening of the 14th, try and get it in the day before. Um, the reason I'm coming back to this slide is that um, that formal six week period that we're, we've now got two weeks left on, we're 1st of February now, we've got two weeks left, this is when it counts. All the ideas we've had before have been great, they've helped us get the plan in place, but we really want to hear people's views now. The more we have now, the more we can understand the revisions and changes that are needed before it goes to Rother District Council. That's really important. And uh, that's the web address and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.